Our next, next speaker is from AWA Clarion Division, Sydney. Uh, he's going to talk on in-car entertainment, covering the subjects of AM stereo, electrostatic discharge control, and advances in AM and FM reception. Paul, who will be giving the talk, Paul Moss, began his career as a radio technician with the New Zealand Post Office in the field of microwave and land mobile communications. Prior to joining AWA as a technical officer, he was engaged in the manufacture of sound and lighting systems for the entertainment industry. Paul's current responsibilities include evaluation of in-car entertainment products and providing support for a national marketing and service network. Uh, gentlemen, Paul Moss. Thank you. Just one point that I have thought of in the last few minutes, or actually today, I've noticed that uh, we have seem to have very few ladies in the industry directly connected with, um, let's say, servicing of in-car sound. And it seems to me that from market surveys, women have quite a strong vote, in fact, more than 50% in the determination of the car that people buy these days. And I think possibly um, we should all look a little closer at that. Um, probably the central theme to car entertainment is going to be fashion and culture. I think we all tend to think of in-car sound as being an information source and for news and weather and possibly background music. But increasingly, and this is especially in the cities, it has profound um, implications for people who live their music because they find themselves snarled up in traffic jams and with all of the frustrations of city life, they wish to have some kind of release, let's say. There have been parallels with wanting to go to the cocktail bar and having a drink being very similar psychologically as turning the volume up on a big amplifier. And I feel that that is the single most important reason why in-car sound over the next 10 years will affect us, because we will be servicing things that mean a good deal more to the consumer now than what possibly they have meant to us when we've gone out and just bought a radio. Um, I feel as though I'm a, attending the birth of a new era in technology, um, possibly like all of us. And that's probably because digital sound has entered the marketplace. and. New products are going to be developed at an increasingly rapid pace to tempt and tantalise the consumer because of all those reasons that I mentioned before. AM stereo is at long last a reality um, and diversity tuning in FM receivers has on the market, has entered the, the field, let's say, the competitive field. A host of other techniques, including noise reduction systems, biamping, switch mode supplies that we're used to in television systems, and subwoofers, separate tweeters and mid-range units, component speakers, are rushing headlong in to meet the trend. There is no reason to believe that the microprocessor revolution is going to slow. I get the feeling that I quite often have this dual feeling that we have two things happening here. One is that we've reached the peak, we've reached the limit, that nothing more can, can take place, um, we're oversaturated. The other one is, when I put my feet on the ground and look at it, that in reality the products are going to get smaller and more complex, and that's simply because the manufacturers want it that way, that because it will continue sales, and the public and seem to enjoy it. Um, I see no reason to believe that there will be any change in that. So 
The other thrust of my talk is that we need preparation, and that is in line with the discussions that we've had on training today. The new technology is not without special problems. I'm sure that we've, we're all starting to closely come into touch with that. I regularly deal with people that I really feel possibly have their heads in the sand with this particular problem, and I'm not dealing necessarily with the, the technical industry because I think that we're rising to cope with the situation. And um, a friend of mine drew an analogy just recently that it's going to become increasingly difficult to keep your head in the sand because rocks are coming along and we're going to start hitting our noses up against them. The Information Technology Month has passed by. I don't know if anybody was directly concerned with that. That, to me, is a, a sign that possibly um, the government is interested in stimulating our knowledge and our desire to take products and utilise them to disseminate the specialist information that we all need. It's quite possible, for instance, uh, are there, is there anybody here that has facsimile machines in, in use on a regular basis? Well, a facsimile machine to me has opened my eyes to the possibility of instant communication um, worldwide. The world, we're all told, is shrinking every day, but in fact, I, in the last 12 months, having a, a facsimile machine in the laboratory gives us instant communication with Japan. Um, there's no longer any need to go through excessive documentation routines. We just handwrite a document, put on diagrams and things, shoot them over and they shoot them back. It's quite possible to have an answer back within half an hour, maybe two hours if it's a bit complicated. Um, often the, the next day, uh, they seem to work day and night in Japan. And I, that is an awareness thing that I've been going through and it has, as I said, really opened my eyes to the possibilities that facsimile machines will help us because you can put through circuit diagrams. It's very difficult to put a circuit diagram down the telephone. If you've ever tried to fault find on a phone or help somebody solve a, a problem on a telephone, it becomes a very tedious exercise. I think we should all watch the microcomputers for um, ways and means that we can use them in our own environment for um, whatever, storing data and uh, information and retrieving it instantly instead of getting um, st stacks and stacks of paperwork that we have to sort through, which is my problem for sure. I don't know if you have that, that same problem that computers and um, the world in general seem to be chopping down trees and filling up filing cabinets at a never-increasing rate. Uh, I'm told that only, I think, 17% of paper that goes into a filing cabinet ever comes back out for a, the first look, or the second look. FM stations, in general, are reasonably careful to broadcast a flat response or a reasonably smoother response with very minimal signal processing compared to, let's say, the AM stations. Some stations use a cartridge format with full DBX encoding and decoding and totally automated arrays of cartridges that a robot goes along, selects the cartridge, plugs it in, queues it up, several cartridges in advance with announcements as well so that to the consumer it sounds like a perfectly normal state of affairs, only it can be completely automated. Now there's at least one station in Sydney that does that, a commercial station, Today FM, and um, I haven't noticed any evidence of that machine in action, but it's just that I do know that, it is, that they do use it. Other stations use a kind of DBX encoding at the higher modulation depths to ensure that they don't exceed the 75 kilohertz deviation that's uh, imposed on them, but also to make sure that they get this loudness um, comparison so that they sound like the loudest station. In our case, that's two triple M. I don't know. I think it may be three 
EON in, in Melbourne, but I'm not sure about that. And their multiband compression techniques are uh, used with care, and I think a professional attitude seems to be more um, obvious to me that the FM stations that I'm used to dealing with have, have a much more balanced sound, where nowadays, switching directly backwards and forwards between stations, you can easily hear that the AM stations have very excessive amount of compression. The, the AM stations use systems that split the audio frequency band up into multi, multiple segments and use different time constants on, in each segment to achieve the a perceived loudness in the car so that they can say, well, we're the loudest station. They don't seem to be too interested in quality as such. They use marketing um, opinions, let's say. It's program managers that actually decide the sound of an AM station. It's not the engineers um, or the technical people. We, I don't think we really get much consideration in that at all. And they have, in their uh, media bulletins, suggested that they will in fact Im increase the bandwidth of transmission and reduce the amount of processing that this audio signal goes through when AM stereo comes along. But another factor has, seems to have entered the marketplace that I've become aware of in the last few weeks, and that is that the advertisers, this is one of those unpredictables that comes along and changes everything, the, the advertising, people that spend a lot of money on advertising have become a little disenchanted with the paper type media, the newspapers, and the budgets are moving back towards AM radio. Because of that, the AM stations are focusing in on ratings again, and the ratings game, competitiveness of AM stations, personalities is back on the rise. Uh, this may only apply in the main cities where there might be 10 stations vying for 20% um, of the total audience. I don't know that for sure. I don't have any information on that. Um, I, don't, I would incidentally welcome information later on uh, regarding stations in your particular area. I particularly, in fact, any comments on AM receiving and broadcasting would be particularly welcomed at the moment because I have um, a personal desire to get this information back to Japan via a Japanese engineer that I work with and I hope to close the loop, the feedback loop, um, so that Japan can understand that while we only represent a few percent of their market, they, our requirements are particularly special. We've been hammering away at them for years on this one, I might add, and it's, it's a battle. <laughs> right. The major influence that started a big swing toward the goal of quality in the car was the huge influx of component stereo systems in the home. And people that have been teenagers while this component stereo has been coming in from Japan have now graduated to um, a group commonly known as people with disposable incomes that don't have the responsibilities that a lot of us have with families and houses. And I'm sure that you're aware of that in the shop situation where people come in and they've got $1,000 or $2,000. Recently I've seen three and $4,000 installations in cars, and the cars, are not, we're not talking about fifteen dollars or $20,000 cars, we're still talking about under $10,000 cars. Um, and in fact I took a, a, no, a noise meter um, out to a car recently to measure the levels that the customer was getting and I would say that before, dis before significant distortion, certainly before clipping level, he could attain average levels of 105 dBA, which is pretty loud, and on um, Pavarotti and Jane Sutherland they would peak to 110 dBA. Um, he had roughly 200 watts and four four speakers, yeah. My quick point on, on the on that power rating, why is it that for we had a situation where we had to provide power to a speaker in the dinosaur which was running on twelve volts. Now we tried several high power car systems, no 
only allowed in that. Same wattage, same rate as amplifier, uh, 245 run, run from an inverter, very loud. Why? What? what? Yeah, apparent power. I would, I mean, I don't, I don't know, but I would suggest, I would suggest the regulation and the power supply. You know, um, the 230 volt mains, provided there's a sizable transformer, you can keep on draining through there, and besides, there could be regulators. We actually have an amplifier here with a switch mode supply that is rated at 75 watts per channel at a fairly low THD, and that has a switch mode regulator that has direct feedback from the current output back into the inverter input. So, and it uses a, a one inch toroid at 40 kilohertz, or 25 microsecond duty cycle, really. And that handles the full 200 watts draw, 28 amps into the thing at full power. And that's designed for bi-amping, so you need two of those. <laughs> now, I, I also think it's funny too, but on a more serious note, I've been concerned with the entertainment industry for quite a long time, supplying services, and I understand that for every time, every 3 dB increment, you know, you need a lot of power to get a more loudness. You need to multiply your watts. And it's quite common to use several thousand watts in an entertainment situation. Not necessarily for the power that 7,000 watts on a sine wave can produce, but simply so that you don't get any overloading on peaks because live music is very peaky. And the, the point there is that if you consider a bass drum that's used in every, virtually every modern music situation, it may have a skin diameter of 15 inches or something like that, and some guy is jumping on it with his foot. The travel of that bass drum is a few inches, so that is a lot of cubic capacity of air to move. Because of that, to get realistic levels, even in a car situation, uh, the focus has been on speakers. The speakers are the weak link in the chain, and I'm sure we all know that speakers are getting bigger and louder, but there have been some fairly subtle changes in things like compliance. The actual speakers are more compliant now, and therefore it seems that they're less tolerant of just any old mounting. Um, the higher powered systems are being, uh, forcing us to look at rigid mounting systems and sealed um, air cavities to increase the compliance ratio, that increasing the compliance is about the only thing that we can do to improve the performance of a modern speaker. The, the factories that churn out speakers have preset the design values, and that's it. But I have noticed a lot of bottoming in loudspeaker installations in um, where the speaker can't handle the amplifier power. In fact, that is a, a common problem that they put in because of the budget, in any particular installation, the speakers are usually underrated according to the power of the amplifier. And that is maybe okay for serious listeners that can turn the volume up and they can hear clipping and the peak. But I've seen a lot of demonstrations in my time that I've been a little embarrassed to attend where the volume has been turned up and there's been 10% distortion and the tweeters have popped out. Um, Sim just simple mismanagement. Um, I think that this is a problem that we all have to come to terms with, but possibly it's um, it's not necessarily our responsibility. It depends on whether we're in the shop or marketing situation where we're doing demonstrations or uh, in the service situation. I think our responsibility probably goes as far as listening to the tweeters and seeing. It's sometimes a bit difficult to determine whether they are, are radiating because in two-way speakers, they very rarely use, use any kind of low pass on the woofer. That just runs wide open, and the tweeters are crossed over, and if they pop out, well, it just doesn't sound quite as bright, but if, they, if you don't have any A-B comparison, you're um, left with a guessing game. I have um, some sp specialist information on how 
radios actually get into cars because I think that a significant um, influence in the marketplace is the car company and the car companies have decreed certain um, specifications for models because car companies think in terms of five-year blocks. Um, they're not as concerned with the car coming back later. They want to, they take a lot of care in establishing quality assurance systems to ensure that the products are, um, are as higher quality to start with so that they don't have to worry about the car as too much after it's been sold. That seems to be our job. One of the requirements that they've made is that the uh, for 1987 and 88 models, for instance, they've got drawn up three main levels of product. The first one is that there will be no AM radio only by 1988. There will be a, a plain AM FM radio. It has become a, more economical to produce both tuners in a radio now than just one only for the simple um, reason that completely automated assembly has overtaken Japan and it's based on simply on um, numbers. They just play the numbers game. The second level up will be the mechanically tuned radio. Um, that may last, I apologize there actually, the, the mechanically tuned radio has been, it has been decreed that that will be gone by 1988. So phase lock loops are in, in a big way. Also the, um, the third level is of course the electronic tuning set as we now know it, but they have, subject to ergonomic studies, they've decided that there will be no longer any further knobs on radios, they will be flat, programmable. It's either what the market wants or it's what the car companies have decided that the, that the market may want. They I think are still considering that, but that is something that we will also have to get used to, that it will all be key input. It, the economics of it, from the manufacturing point of view, are pushing it in. And then to obtain levels, intermediate levels for different products, although I think that that is something that the government is obviously trying to reduce now, the number of models, they'll simply add and subtract multiple speakers, faders, electric aerials, whatever, <coughs> excuse me, whatever. The products are often based on laboratory technology that has not been tried in the marketplace and the first models that, especially in the high-tech products, go to the car companies um, long before there is any sort of reliability study or feasibility study. And a scutcheon, for instance, can be handmade in a laboratory in Japan or in a workshop, and quite easily budgets of one million yen or five thousand dollars are spent on making a simple mock-up escutcheon that doesn't work; it just looks the part. That that is a typical figure. Three years before the production begins, the car company requests from the manufacturer submissions of products at the different levels of performance and feature content. A development plan with the corresponding time frame is mapped out for a car and a code name is assigned for security purposes. Now, the code names are a pretty peculiar thing for cars because I find that I get to know a, a particular project that a car company is dealing with by its code name. And even when the car comes to the marketplace, I then have to unlearn that code name and, and substitute the real name for the car. Quite often, we find one to two years after the car has hit the marketplace, we're still talking about it with its particular code name. Um, I, the Meteor, for instance, was, its code name was Virgo. And to me, a, a Meteor will always be a Virgo. I, I just don't know it as a Meteor as such. The product is um, designed into a working model that's hand-built in Japan and delivered to our department or to the Australian supplier that has concerned for evaluation. We often at that stage require to make modifications to units because specifications change overnight. 
it's a, a daily basis, keeping up with the play. Occasionally, uh, the products come through without any modification, but it's the exception rather than the rule. The, there are a lot of comments on specifications zipping backwards and forwards between car companies and the suppliers and the manufacturers, and from the engineer at the end of the car company, through the chain of executives and laboratories and personnel to the engineer in Japan, there, I think I've counted 10 steps, and if we've all played the party game of communications and passed the message along, I'm sure you all know that there's plenty of room for error. And that happens quite often when we have to perform uh, in-house modifications to a production shipment of maybe um, 100 radios or up to 5,000 radios. And a curious thing happens here. The robot assembled radios have proved themselves to be much more reliable than other shipments that have come along, originally robot assembled and hand opened, modified, put back together, put into a car. The difference in percentages between a half a percent for completely robot assembled models to up to two percent for either hand assembled models or robot radio ro robot assembled radios that have been modified or put together finished by hand let's say so at that stage when we all arrive at a final conclusion and we all say right that's what we want we call for a product called an off tool sample and the car companies demand that they get a batch of radios that have been made with the same tooling that is going to be used in a production basis so that they can assess the quality of the production. And I'm sure you can imagine that it all gets very expensive and there's a lot of money invested in Japan when quite often the Japanese manufacturer doesn't necessarily know whether he's going to get the job or not. He might have spent two, three hundred thousand dollars simply on submissions. Engineering departments at that stage, once the off-tool samples get approved, draw up inspection instructions, passing direct control of the quality to a quality assurance department, and that's where my job nearly gets finished. Um, after that, it becomes easy. We just keep we we're a, um, we keep an overview of the product as it as it goes into the car, and then shortly after that the service industry comes into the picture when the first of the models start failing in the field and I'm sure as you all know there is a certain percentage that will um, fail fairly soon after they've been switched on or released. One of the problems that the radios, even the robot assembled radios have is that the development in components has been following a trend that we're all familiar with, and that's increasing complexity and reduced um, geometry. The, they're packing more features into a smaller space, and to do that, naturally, they're going, going upwards from LSI to hybrid modules. In our case, we've, we've got a string of hybrid modules now, um, thick film circuits that have Dolby ICs welded direct on. Um, our base and treble systems are now one piece, one replaceable piece. It's not really anything new. I know it's been in the industry for a while, but it's flowing into the um, car products at an ever-increasing rate. ESD is the transfer of charge between bodies at different potentials, a, a fundamental electrical phenomena that we all learnt when we were very young. For example, when common plastic bags are rubbed, the charge may be only a few hundred volts on the bench. But when the bag is picked up by an operator, the charge increases. It zooms up because if, uh, a few simple mathematics with the conservation of charge and voltage says that if you increase the distance, the voltage has to increase to keep the charge constant. And if you've ever handled um, printed circuit board material before production, with a, dial a large surface area and a very small distance apart with a dielectric, they get charged and when you separate the printer circuit boards, zap, the spark goes across. Recently we had a problem with cassettes coming out of the CBS factory, loaded 
full of electrostatic charges. Um, I, sus I haven't visited the factory yet, I don't know for sure, but I suspect that in the high-speed copy machines they act as a, a Wimshurst generator with plastic, ro big rolls of plastic that are, have charges everywhere. When they get loaded into the cassette, the cassette appears to get a massive electrostatic energy and then it gets sealed up and bundled up and it stays there until the poor old consumer comes along and in this case it happened to be a warehouse uh, employee that had bought one from his company, put it into his car and the next thing he knew the LED display went out and the radio stopped and it wouldn't work. It didn't matter if he turned it on or off, nothing. Took the cassette out, no difference. I don't know if we, if many of you know about the microprocessor lockup. We had this problem with op amps, I think, but with CMOS ICs, if you lock up, you can lock up the, the totem pole outputs. You get a heavy current drain. In our case, the regulator dropped from 5 volts to 3.5 volts, and the microprocessor was totally confused. And the only solution was to remove the battery backup lead that um, backs up the memory which obviously goes back to the battery uh, without going through the ignition switch. Now, on investigation of that, I discovered that, in fact, if you put on fast forward and rewind, you could actually hear the sparks coming out of the cassette housing, standard audio cassette. I couldn't see them, but if I put my finger on the cassette housing, I could get shocks zipping out through the gap in the cassette, physically feel a shock from a cassette driven at high speed. And that... I think made us all aware of this problem. Now, it isn't a new problem. We've been dealing with it with MOS circuits, and I'm sure we're all aware of that. But the problem is one of awareness because we've, we've thought that it only applies to MOS or metal oxide on silicon components. We've tended to regard that there is no problem, that she'll be right as long as we look after the MOS or even CMOS is protected so well these days that even that doesn't seem to fail too readily. The insidious part of this whole ball game is that damage can take place to all components, these surface mount components like the, th the um, chip capacitors and chip resistors and the precision resistor arrays that are used as A to D converters um, and open collector pull-up resistors. They don't look like a resistor, they look like an IC, and, and it's very easy to discount the possibility of a resistor going open circuit, um, or even partially open circuit. But the energy can go in there and damage that component. It can sit there damaged for a while while it's still working um, for maybe three months, six months. But it has been shown very clearly with by cutting open these components and inspecting them with um, high-powered microscopes, the damage lies there for a while and then shows its head. And then at that stage, you have a warranty problem. So all I can say is that your company can save money by implementing some minimal techniques of protecting the components and the equipment against electrostatic discharge. Now, this thing here is used by our entire production um, and service department in the division of Asheville, where I am. Um, this is one of the more expensive ones. It's $25, and the band is conductive. This thing here is, I suppose, a wire of some sort, but it has a one mega ohm resistor in there, so that if your earthing system does go up to mains potential for some reason, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's self-explanatory, <laughs> yeah. Now, that does raise an interesting question because I'm sure that quite a few of you work on television sets. In my case, um, all my work at the moment is low voltage, 12 volt. Uh, there is a, an occasional mains, but most of it. And so there is no problem, and so there's no problem with safety. But I suggest that from the safety angle, when you go we, through this implementation of static control, and we all we must do this, we must look at this problem closely and regard it as an investment that will pay off in a very short period of time, that you look at the safety angle. And that means not only the one meg resistor in there, 
but also a one meg resistor from an earth mat that um, is at home on the bench where you work and then of course all other conductive bodies, metal instruments must be tied back to that same common earth and obviously the easiest place for that to go back is the mains earth. There was another little problem we struck and that's that we naturally searched because we're using large quantities of things like the earth mats we searched for economic sources and we came up with one that is in on the back of one of those pieces of paper um, cicada shock eye. Now they do, I think, I don't think they deal in maybe a single earth mat like 3M will sell one earth mat. In fact, to digress, the 3M product is actually more user friendly, let's say, in that it has an installation kit, all kinds of nuts and bolts and wires and things and, and information. In fact, I've given you information there um, as to the 3M product. Now, that's the most expensive of them all, but it also is the nicest. It has it is a nice surface to work on, it's large, it has a good feeling about it, and, and you get the hardware. With this Cicada Shock Eye version, it's called Cropoly Mat, it's a, a carbon impregnated rubber, and it comes from Japan wrapped up in a sealed bag, and we have had one or two people that have opened the bag, cut the mat off, put it on their bench, and then promptly gone sick with nausea, headaches, stomach problems, simply because, like all rubber products, there's a lot of um, pre-release agents, gases and stuff that come off the mat, off the rubber when it's first opened. I'm sure you all know about tyres and things like that. You've probably smelt it all. So if you do buy that product, be sure to open it out and leave it hanging up somewhere for a couple of days before you put it on the bench, because we all work very close to our, our bench. and. It's a human problem that nobody says anything about. The documentation just does not mention it. There's also, on that rear page of that, or there is another page that I've um, supplied that has the addresses, parameters in, up in Sydney and Melbourne as well have um, an, a, a couple of agencies, one of them called Analog Devices. And they produce a publication called an ESD handbook and also they produce another a handbook by Semtronics. Now, Semtronics are a manufacturer of all kinds of products to help us deal with this problem. And at this stage, they are saying that they will be cheaper than 3M and just as good quality. So it would be worth writing to them if you don't have the handbook and asking for that. And I'm sure they'll be happy to oblige. They rushed up with a, a box full of them the other day for me. And I think th that the handbook will actually detail all of the things that you need to do. The handbook gets a little bit theoretical as you progress into it. And in fact, there's a very real danger here. And that is the percentage of cure, let's say, that you're aiming for. If you want 95% reliability, then, or whatever, I'm just a figure out of my head then the minimum requirement to get an acceptable level will be a wrist strap, an earth mat, and the rest of the protection procedures, the grounded soldering iron like I'm sure we all need. And unless you like to work hot on the equipment like I do sometimes, and then you can't use a grounded soldering iron. Um, but I assure you I, w I won't be doing that anymore with the new products. If you want to go further than that, then the manual tells you that you need um, floor mats to stand on and protection right through. It, it is all available but it becomes very expensive and you need to trade off somewhere a compromise level. Maybe you only need to get to 99%. There's certainly no need to get to a, a mill specification on consumer products. And once again I think your company can save money and I honestly believe that the main thrust of any electrostatic control program is an awareness program that from manager right across the board through the technical staff and there's a, another danger in that Storman and Packer um, 
I don't know if you have that problem, maybe you take the spare parts direct, but the spare parts must be opened there in a protected area. So if there's any packing or repacking or cutting up and s splitting them and sending them around, they must be done in a, a protected workstation. Um, the awareness is, I think, the single most important thing, and I can't stress that too strongly at the risk of sort of getting too repetitious on that one. And just thinking about it daily to put your wrist strap on and you think about putting charges into things. The thing is the charges move around. It doesn't, doesn't matter what you pick up. I'm sure we've all had shocks off car doors quite regularly. The irony of it is that modern life um, with uh, car synthetic carpets and synthetic clothes and plastic bags everywhere, plastic containers for spare parts, it's, it's all adding to the problem. The hope the problem is growing. It's a bit like an iceberg that we've managed to be able to ride over, but it's getting bigger, and if, if we, we have to do something about it. Another subject that I'd like to speak on is bioamplification. Because of the reasons I spoke of before, that um, people who live their music are increasingly spending more money on in cars, they're going wanting these new techniques. Now, bioamplification is not new. It was certainly used when speaker technology was um, coming of age back in the 30s, the Hollywood theatres and sound stages used bioamplification to make it easier on themselves. And in the 30s, it, was, it came about in the USA that in high-end audio, they tried to use bioamping again, but then speaker technology outgrew the need for it. And so it died because it was too expensive to buy four amplifiers when stereo came along. Now that amplifiers are much more economic, it seems to be having a comeback. And for the other cultural factors, that music is dynamic range is increasing. Um, apart from the reduced modu intermodulation distortion, you get a better damping factor because there aren't any crossover components and bits and pieces in the line between the speaker. It's directly hooked into the amplifier. In the case of this big power amplifier here, the um, power leads are supplied long enough to put it in the boot because there isn't any other place to put it anyway. But that means that the speaker leads are very short and so the speaker is actually controlled by the amplifier in a, in a much better way. Um, that also reduces second harmonic distortion that to most of us isn't a problem, but to a lot of people, especially musicians, second harmonic distortion is not so bad, I suppose, in some ways, because it's musically okay in tune. But it means that there, you can actually do away with the fundamental, as long as you've got the second harmonic there of the bass notes, then you, psychologically your brain just puts in the fundamental and you think, oh, great bass. And, and I think a lot of radios uh, over the years have played on that factor, especially in cars. And in fact, it hasn't been good bass at all. It's simply been lots of the second harmonic. Now, whatever we can do with the damping factor, and that means by amping, will help the people that really want good sound. Um, right, noise reduction techniques are another factor that we need to look at fairly closely because the marketplace has just expanded right out and there's now such a complication the consumers are faced with a real dilemma as to how to, they can't go and buy a radio with um, something that will suit themselves very readily. So I think we need to look much closer in at DBX and Dolby C. Dolby B was okay for the marketplace maybe in the la up until the last few years, but with increased power and speakers and the demand for people to have quality because they now have it in their home, they want between 20 and 30 dB of noise reduction, and Dolby B will only give 10. My whole collection is Dolby C oriented, and it's a constant problem with me. I don't have at the stage a Dolby C decoder. Um, DBX will as well give a, a much greater dynamic range, and that brings along other problems in that there are very few DBX tapes 
available in a, in, in a music store. If you go to any music store, I haven't actually seen one for sale at this stage. I believe that they are available somewhere in Australia. However, the DBX products are out on the market because manufacturers like TIAC have been singing the praises of DBX. They've used it in studios for quite a long time and they've put it into the domestic marketplace and there's been quite a lot of enthusiasm by um, hi-fi people or people that like their music. And the other sources of noise reduction is the DNR. I've seen recently a couple of implementations of dynamic noise reduction um, that was patented by National Semiconductor recently that have been thoroughly disappointing. One, for instance, was a car radio that was in fact manufactured in Tokyo and shipped to the USA to the people who designed and patented the car and AM stereo system. And when I got hold of the radio, the DNR switch simply sounded like a, a high cut tone control for the, the reason being that the levels hadn't been set up in the, in the equipment or maybe something had changed, but maybe they didn't understand DNR. I don't know the reasons why exactly. Um, that means that in the marketplace, DNR will be, because if there's little education, it will be just switched off. Now, people will get a very negative opinion when, in fact, the research has cost a lot of money and the product's there, and it is very useful, particularly on things like um, domestic video. Uh, the advantage on it is that you don't need an encoded source. It, it simply comes along and it's a, a sliding low-pass filter that opens up as the music comes in dynamically, and it's simply because the speed of ICs have, has increased to the point where we can do that kind of thing these days. The compact disc is moving very rapidly into the car marketplace. The first one has been on show in the Motor Show in Sydney two weeks ago, and in fact is being transported around the country right now. Um, the problem with the putting a compact disc in a car situation, I'm sure you possibly most of you would be aware, was this transport stability, the actual mechanical problems of um, using a, a micro optics that required precise tracking. The compact disc, the track widths, approximately one sixtieth of a conventional record groove. And while the disc actually looks flat across the top, it in, in fact moves up and down the equivalent of a hundred optical tracks. And so while the laser has to be tracked very accurately um, along the groove, it also has to move up and down a hundred times the distance that it's, that it's trying, the spot that it's focused on. So in a car situation, they seem to have got over it by using hydraulic damping and um, just reducing the whole assembly size. And they claim that, in fact, nothing short of a four-wheel drive will actually dislodge it. Um, hard to believe. I'm still waiting to see that. But there is a Walkman CD player available in Japan for $250 with line outputs that you can plug into your car or your ear. <laughs> and it's um, the same size as the compact disc uh, case, an inch and a half thick, $250. US dollars. There is a very negative reaction to this in the industry. Uh, it goes along the lines of, oh, what do you want that for, or how can I get value for money out of that? But in fact, it's because consumers from our age down are attaching much greater cultural values to these things. They, they think about them um, in completely different terms than possibly what we do, because to them, music is um, a, a source of energy that is a little difficult for them to articulate when they get into the shop or to the service department. Now AM Stereo has um, zoomed in. We're very lucky. Uh, I, in case some of you may have missed, the Motorola system is definitely in at the only system. It isn't necessarily regarded as the best, but at least the consumers don't get uh, a raw deal this time. They don't have any dilemma. Um, it's been floating around the industry. They just go in and buy a radio and it will decode all AM stereo stations. And I think that's a, a feather in the cap for somebody in this country, maybe the DOC for a change. 
there have been a lot of trials on all four systems in Sydney, and I think it's been a little deceptive because there hasn't really been any radios about design to take advantages of the possibilities. And in my case, I've just inspected a, a Motorola system with in increased bandwidth. And I, all I can say to you is that the transmitter, the AM transmitter, is capable of high quality sound and it, the weak link in the chain will be there'll be two weak links in the chain but one of them will be the car radio we'll have to look very closely at the bandwidth and oscillator stability but the other the other exercise there will be watching and waiting to see what the am stations do with their their audio processing techniques not content with that the industry can see that there are two thrusts for that because there'll be people that want to um, stick with FM and there is a new product on the market called a diversity ra tuning radio and that the object of that exercise is to get over the multi-path noise problem that FM has inherent because of the short wavelengths and that's achieved by using two completely separate tuners with two antenna, one at the front of the car and one at the back, or spaced as far as possible. And I have um, some printed matter there on the test results that Clarion in Japan did with that. And they found, like I did when I checked it out, that where you might get 20 or 30 noise bursts in one circuit, of a, one test circuit, with a diversity tuner, you can cut that down to between one and five. And it's quite a remarkable experience, especially important when you take a classical music enthusiast who is with one of these big amplifiers, who is running it fairly loud, and with a conventional FM receiver, there's all sorts of noises that are running along there because of the multi-path, and it deals with it. There are, of course, problems in that. There is. The switching is said to be noiseless, but there is a few other problems that our Australian conditions are, um, require a little more feedback to Japan to iron out. I think that I can sum up by saying that I'm still a little dubious about the commercial interests of the radio stations and perhaps even cynical, that they will come to the party because I think perceived loudness in the car, their desire for their station to be the loudest when you push the buttons is way up the priority list and that quality is probably not quite as important because I don't think the public have been clamouring enough for that and the people that are quality conscious have taken alter alternative routes of cassette with chrome tape and noise reduction systems and or FM and of course now the CD players. I still await the next period of broadcasting in Australia with genuine interest. Um, just a little note to that, I'd like to say that if you do need to know anything about AM stereo that uh, if you haven't got ETI and Electronics Australia, the October, both October issues of both um, of those publications featured some pretty in-depth analysis and I have some reference material here that Motorola have supplied me with and um, I'm happy to let you have a look at it or attempt to answer any questions that you have on that. Um, I'd like to say thank you for the AWA team that have actually helped me here, they've been very good. Thank you. Any questions? Ah, right. Yes, that's the ultimate question, isn't it? Well, I'll divert that question because I don't think that the dynamic range is, is as important. It seems to be the thing that everybody focuses in on and says, what do you need that for, you know? I think that the cultural values of music are a much more important factor that will push this in to the marketplace. The only thing stopping this at the moment is the price. There's no, nothing else. If the range is on the disc, what are you going to do with it in the car? Are you going to 
Well, it doesn't seem to matter because um, you could do that if you wanted to, <laughs> if you really wanted to. Uh, because the dynamic range on a, on a disc is not the only, th only um, plus, you see. You, I think that people tend to take that out of context, that say, oh, it's got 90 dB range, so it makes it unusable, when in fact, um, if you go to any disco or, or band um, in one of the bigger cities, where these things will obviously be sold in much bigger quantities, you'll find that they're using their full 90 dB range. I mean, it might be painful, but it's being used, and people want it, and they'll get it because they're prepared to pay for it. Because, as I said, it's an energy experience. It's like going on to a bar and having a few extra drinks to, you know, to drain your sorrows and mortgage payments and stuff. Oh, right, but with But that's only if you um, listen to music that has that kind of dynamic range. If you listen to Michael Jackson Thriller or Dire Straits or something, then um, this is excellent in a car. So what are you gaining on that on CD as against the uh, high quality cassette system then for that use? A feeling. It feels good. Well, well, I don't think, but that's the thing I, um, I had written down here, I didn't say, but cultural values to music are going to make a much bigger impact to the use of this thing and the thrust of this going into um, the house and the car than what any engineering analysis will ever do. And, and that's the whole point of the discussion, that music is music, but uh, numbers don't actually say all the words, do they? Uh, but I, I tend to agree with you. I, I understand that.